Good day. Welcome to another edition of the QB Power Hour. Uh, I'm Dan DeLong, and we have a special guest with us today, along with Michelle Long. Uh, but today is going to be all about our series of niche nuances. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about e-commerce. And one of the things that I hope we determine is how to spell e-commerce. Is there a dash? Is there a capital E? Is there a capital C? That that's if that's my takeaway from today, I think that's that will be great. Uh, Michelle, you want to introduce Hi, yourself? Hi, everybody. Glad, glad you guys are joining us today. Michelle Long with Long for Success, author of five books. Check them out on Amazon. Love to have you guys join us for uh, on the Facebook group. We need to, I need to update that. Dan, aren't we over 9,000 members now yeah. on our Facebook yeah, group? Yeah, we are. We are well over 9,000, close to 10. Yeah, so we'd love to have you join us out there, continue the conversation, and I hope everybody is surviving tax season, staying safe, and we're very glad to have Veronica joining us today. Uh, my name is uh, Dan DeLong, owner of Dan With, a former Intuit employee, um, technically edited uh, QBO for Dummies uh, in the fifth edition. And, um, you know, the motto of my company is transforming businesses through technology. And, um, you know, we were, we were planning this particular session uh, a couple weeks ago, unknown to the... the <laughs> The, uh, the the state of current affairs and um, you know, it's definitely one thing about e-commerce uh, is that uh, it's it's definitely uh, looking pretty good right now. <laughs> uh, so um, we have a special guest with us today, uh, Veronica Wasik. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, Dan. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. So I am Veronica Wasik. I'm an entrepreneur, CPA, a QuickBooks online expert, and I specialize in e-commerce. I'm also a mentor and educator. I'm the CEO and founder of VM Wasik, and we uh, work with clients all throughout the U.S. Um, in various industries, but as of last year, switched my niche to e-commerce and, and, and now working with a lot of e-commerce sellers. Um, I have a Facebook group also, 5-Minute Bookkeeping with QuickBooks Online. Um, you can also find me on my blog at 5-Minute Bookkeeping. And, and I also have an online course, uh, the 5MB Academy. And um, I also have a YouTube channel, and um, you can find all of my my videos as well as my e-commerce playlist on my YouTube channel. Awesome. Now, the, I, I detect a theme with the five-minute bookkeeping. Uh, so ha tell us a little bit about how that started. Yes, it's because um, people have a different opinion of what five-minute bookkeeping means to them. But the, the way it started was that many years ago when I – um, had my business for maybe a year or two, I was working with a client and training her on QuickBooks desktop and showing her what she was going to do to um, do her own books. And she just turned to me like, oh my gosh, like, do you mean I have to do all of this work? And I said, uh, well, you do if you want to do your own bookkeeping. And she said, well, I don't think I can do it. And, and I said, well, can you do five minutes a day? And she said, yes, I can do five minutes a day. And so that's where it all started, you know, the idea of five-minute bookkeeping, of encouraging business owners to to engage with their financials at least five minutes a day. So the idea of uh, eating the elephant five minutes at a time instead of one bite at a time. Yeah, because most <laughs> of them just tend to out. put off, you know, put it off till it's done. Yeah, it's an elephant at that point. <laughs> Especially if they're behind in their bookkeeping. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Okay, I so love that. Little uh, little updates on the on the QB Power Hour. Obviously, today we're going to be talking about the niche nuances in e-commerce. Next uh, next episode is going to be all about bank feeds, um, and then we of course have the PDFs of the slides, the link there, uh, as well as uh, current uh, QB Power Hours. Uh, the link to be able to go see the, the current list of, of QB Power Hour episodes and then historicals, you can go to Michelle uh, Michelle's uh, YouTube channel. And then we also have the podcast uh, to be able to, to listen to us on the go. Obviously, you know, you won't be able to see the slides there, uh, but uh, getting something like, like today's uh, episode uh, is, is very good to, to even just to hear. Uh, so other, some other upcoming events, obviously with the new new uh, new episodes coming out, and then we also have the VCon and Roadshow. You can always go to QBTrainingEvents.com 
and look for live training in your area. Probably not today. <laughs> uh, there's probably not going to be too many live trainings uh, in in that area, of the, especially if there's more than 10 people. <laughs> yes, we uh, so, are on hold for right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so events like this, where you can come in and and be self quarantined and still <laughs> still be able to uh, to get some get some uh, other human interactions as well as um, you know learn some learn a little something. So. Here we go. So um, I'm going to launch the first poll. Uh, so again, we would just want to get an understanding of what ver what version of QuickBooks are you currently using? Because as we talk about e-commerce, uh, there's going to be a a bit of a an, an interesting uh, uh, facets of of, of the e-commerce. So we want to get an idea of whether you're using online QuickBooks Desktop or both uh, or not at all. <laughs> uh, so go ahead and answer that question. And Dan, while they're doing that, um, if you all would like to get rid of the um, webcam pictures, mm. uh, you can't do it right this minute while the poll is open, but when we close that poll, you can close and turn off the webcam pictures, or you can drag and drop to minimize that part of the window so that you don't have to see that and you can see more of the slides. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great, uh, great call out there because uh, every once in a while there's a, it, it, it depends on what you, what, what you saw it last. So it certainly could be uh, an issue if you're, uh, you know, visually challenged like some of us that need glasses <laughs> to be able to see those, uh, those slides or the prints on the slides. I think almost okay. all accountants and bookkeepers wind up needing glasses at some point. <laughs> probably, probably. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Uh, so yeah, so most most are, are using both. Um, and then QuickBooks Online gets a little nod and then QuickBooks Desktop. So let me go ahead and hide that and then we'll move back to the slides. Okay, so our agenda today with uh, e-commerce uh, and its nuances, I will talk about uh, sales channels, payment processors, integrations, uh, being able to connect whatever you're selling, what, whatever platform you're selling on into, uh, into your, your bookkeeping, um, and then inventory, cost of goods sold, and then sales tax. So these are all um, elephants. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of elephants, uh, these are big things that I know, you know, from my, my uh, perspective of, of when I worked at Intuit, a lot of people shied away from these, these areas. So not only is it one of them it's it's like the big four of the things that that people really shy away so i applaud veronica for jumping into this niche <laughs> and being able to to, to tackle it so uh, i'm going to hand the slides over to her so give me one second here to make her the presenter and then we'll go on let's see there we go Okay, the ball should be in your court, and then you should just be able to share your slides. Okay, and I want to make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Mm -hmm. are, are you seeing my slides? Uh, we're seeing the other the other screen, if that's... Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> there we, there go. we go. Perfect. All right, so let me jump right in. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get the mic. Hope, okay, I'll talk this way, so make sure <laughs> I'm talking into the mic still. <laughs> we have to adapt with you know technology, mm -hmm. especially e-commerce. We have to adapt. So mm -hmm. uh, first thing we need to know about e-commerce is that you have sales channels and you have payment processors. And, and if you think about it from the standpoint of uh, an invoice and a customer payment in QuickBooks. If we think about it that way, that's that's what it is in e-commerce, but no invoices and no customer payments. So um, you have sales that are happening in a sales channel and uh, the ones that you probably know are like Amazon, Shopify, um, and some others. And in those sales, you have income and other components of sales as well, like 
returns and refunds, fees, reserves, loans, debit cards, sales taxes. It's, it's all happening in that sales channel. And then on the right, we have what's being deposited into QuickBooks or into rather into the bank account, what we're seeing as deposits in QuickBooks. And um, you'll see uh, things like Amazon Payments, Shopify Payments, Stripe, PayPal, Square, um, and you'll see some fees coming out. And the, the most important thing you need to understand is that what we're seeing deposited in the bank account is, is a net amount. So it's net of refunds, um, it's net of fees, um, it may include even loan transactions happening in those net amounts, um, sales taxes are in there as well, and there's a lot of factors that affect then what, what we see being deposited in QuickBooks, including the type of sales channel, each, each sales channel does things differently, um, the different payment processors, uh, locations, timing. There's a lot of timing differences between what happens in a sales channel versus what um, is being processed by the payment processor and the, then what we end up seeing in QuickBooks. Now, is that is that pretty universal with the, with the net deposit uh, for all of them or is there are some trans, uh, some payment processors that will do gross and then take out their fees, or uh, or is that just pretty much standard for for all online payment processors? It's fairly standard, at least for all the ones that I have worked with, to to then see just net amounts being deposited in in the bank account. Gotcha. All right, thanks. So the next important thing you need to know is because most people and say, well, okay, if this all all of this is happening in this in this sales channel, can't I just integrate that sales channel with QuickBooks? And well, you can, and there are a lot of integrations. If you go to apps.com and look up some, you'll find these apps. These are the, what's labeled as e-commerce apps. And uh, you'll see that there's a lot of them. So then how do you choose? Because there's a lot. Well, there's some guidelines that, that I've learned from other people that I have found also to be best practices. And, um, and also just keep in mind that an integration doesn't mean that things are, are going to, as I like to say, automatically going to be done in QuickBooks because um, there are different types of integrations and they're doing different things. And also the app developers are not accountants for the most part. And so they're they're really doing more of a data dump, in my opinion, in, in many cases. And so we have to be um, careful. So the things that were, what are the, the things that we want to avoid in these apps? Uh, sending detailed transactions into QuickBooks Online, especially for, for big sellers. You do not need a thousand transactions a day uh, going into QuickBooks because at some point it'll slow everything down and you don't need to see those details. Um, you want to see, um, and, and I'll summarize, I guess, the no and the yes is sort of the same thing on, on, on both sides here, but we want to see fees broken out um, in QuickBooks. So we want to see those fees that are um, then being broken out and being brought into QuickBooks. We want to be able to, to reconcile the amounts that are being deposited in QuickBooks with the uh, the amounts being processed by the sales channel or being sold on, uh, sorry, the amounts being processed by the payment processor or being sold through that sales channel. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a really good integration in terms of the account mapping and being able to, um, to control the different components of income. As we said before, we have sales, we have refunds, we have discounts, sales taxes, fees. And ideally we want to be able to map each of those components into separate accounts in QuickBooks for those specific sales channels. When you talk about uh, summarized totals in, in QuickBooks, um, how much detail do you, do you ultimately uh, expect to, to get in, in QuickBooks? Um, you know, as far as like the different, you know, depending if it's a uh, clothing, for example, do you, do you want to have uh, if shoes versus, 
versus shirts versus pants or you know different departments broken down or is that is that something you look for or is it really just what you hand you handle that in the in the selling platform as far as getting that detail or, or gleaning those insights yeah normally you're handling that in the selling platform and when you think about even online sellers that's that's where they live so they're more comfortable getting the data from there than they would be from quickbooks um, in quickbooks i mean in terms of what we're bringing in summarized it may be daily totals it might be a uh, total for a certain period for example amazon processes payments every two weeks and uh, we'll talk about um, later the app that i like to use that they uh, you have the option of bringing in those totals for those uh, for that two week period with amazon great all right next is and then evaluating these integrations what do we need to be aware of because one size doesn't fit all and it just depends on a particular um, client what their needs are and what we would recommend um, for them to to use as an integration tool um, so as with any in integration i always like to make a list of the client's requirements what do they need specifically and specific to their business uh, evaluate your options as you know there are many options consider the quality of the integration with QBO or with with QuickBooks desktop and again is that how can we break out all of the different components of sales um, test in small batches <laughs> always test in small batches and what I mean is if you then go ahead and and set up that integration just uh, test it for one or two days to make sure it's going to bring over the data the way you expected. Um, what I see most of my, my colleagues do is like, oh, I found an, an app, I'm going to uh, connect it to QuickBooks, and now I'm going to send over a year's worth of transactions. You don't want to do that because I can guarantee you, you will likely have to delete because it, it you know, maybe it didn't work the way you expected. Yeah, and the good, uh, a good damage control plan will be, you know, setting up some kind of uh, backup app before, especially yeah. if you're doing online, because knowing yeah. that uh, there is no restore point, uh, you know, out of the box for for QuickBooks Online uh, desktop, you have a little bit of a, a better option. But again, making sure that you've made a backup uh, yeah. before you, you know, before you integrate these sort of things, and then there's a, a point of no return, and then trying to figure out, okay, how do I how do I back this up and, and and get back to where I started because it didn't? Uh, I need to redo the mappings or, or what have you. So yeah. good point there. And another and, alternative is to to create a new trial subscription, create one of those free 30-day trial subscriptions, and use something like Chronobooks to actually back up the data from the live company and and then import it into that new subscription to do all your testing over there. So you've got the real company info, but in a separate subscription, so you don't mess it up. Yeah. But a, yeah, a very important, data. very but important yeah, you, stuff. Yeah, yeah, you need to, uh, now you can't use uh, Chronobooks anymore because it's, unless it's advanced. <laughs> yeah. That's true. There are other ones out there like Rewind and some other yeah. ones, apps mm -hmm. that'll do the same stuff. And one thing to keep in mind too, because we have um, a lot of, of people who are using QuickBooks online and now are taking QuickBooks desktop clients, and they don't necessarily realize that you can make a backup in, in QB desktop. So uh, I, I saw that a conversation in my own Facebook group about someone who didn't know she could make a backup in QuickBooks desktop. And, and yeah, when I was working on desktop primarily, it was so easy. The first thing you did was make that backup. And, and then if you messed it up, you just, you know, uh, reinstall that backup and kept going. Yeah, my original training for when I worked at Intuit was what that was one of the steps of troubleshooting was make a damage control plan. You know, yeah. if something goes horribly wrong, uh, you know, what 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 would you do to make sure that at least before you started, you're back to where you started and, and backups are are a key part of that. Absolutely. And let's see, and lastly, um, uh, well, uh, number five is customize your workflows because apps change workflows. And so then you have to understand how this, you know, bringing over this data, how that is changing the workflow in QuickBooks Online. And lastly, understanding that integration 
while it may eliminate double data entry, does not eliminate the need to do proper accounting. And I think that's something that a lot of people are kind of misinformed about apps. They think, oh, that eliminates work and it's just, it's changing work, perhaps eliminating double entry, but it, you still have to make sure it's it's going in there properly. Yeah, you end up being a manager of the data as opposed to the creator of the data. So it's, yeah. you still have to make sure it's 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 uh, doing its thing. And then... <laughs> Absolutely. And as I mentioned before, I do have a favorite app that, that I have uh, found, um, and it's called A2X. And so it is an integrator um, app, and, and you can use it for Amazon and Shopify to integrate um, those um, sales channels with um, QuickBooks Online. And um, and it pretty much ticks the box in, uh, for everything that I mentioned before about summary entries. Uh, it records sales into the correct month. So they, they actually have accountants on staff who understand uh, the needs that we have as accountants and bookkeepers. And so they do a great job of really, um, I think they've, they've addressed a lot of the issues that we come across with other apps that are more doing what I call the, a data dump into QuickBooks. I think A2X is really good about understanding what we as accountants need and what that looks like. Um, there is a, a, the ability to reconcile the amounts um, from the sales channel into what's deposited into QuickBooks and especially for Amazon, once the entries come in from A2X, you just go to the bank feed and it just, it's you just match. It's wonderful, it saves a lot of time. They do have a very good integration. They don't sync inventory items in detail to QuickBooks online. And I think I forgot to, to mention that before about we, uh, we don't want to to try to manage inventory in QuickBooks online. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, you have the ability to adjust um, cost of goods sold um, based on um, if you track data in A2X uh, in a particular way. They have amazing support um, and it saves you a lot of time. So I definitely encourage you to look into A2X if you haven't um, uh, worked with it before. Now, do they do they support other shopping carts as well, or do they no. only shop Shopify? Yeah, yeah. They they I, I think what they started out as Amazon sellers mm -hmm. uh, that maybe had an accounting background, and so um, I think probably created this app for their own use, and then realized that there was a market for it. So it's uh, Amazon and Shopify right now. Gotcha. Yeah, so that that's an you know important thing to kind of step back and you know find out what the client's needs are, and then one if they're willing to, you know, modify what they're currently doing to to make things simple simple you know based on your comfort level as far as what you what what you can support them with is is a, a good you know it's a good good part of the conversation um, you know and then. If they do need, you know, inventory synchronization um, because they have a brick and mortar store and a and, and a web store as well, then then they might be looking at something else in between, you know, that uh, th their QuickBooks. So maybe a point of sale software or something like that that does synchronize inventory because if they're selling things out of their store online, <laughs> they need to know, you know, their their inventory levels as well. So, you know. That's all part of the discovery process, uh, right? When you're talking yes. to to your client, you know what's what's best for you and what how can I help you uh, with that? And and I love the uh, I love this topic because um, you know in my in my business I can sell a website too, so you know and that has an e-commerce platform. So uh, you know th these are very helpful tips that you're uh, giving me, and we just happen to have an audience as well. So this is great. Great. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about inventory and cost of goods sold. Because you're right, Dan. Is uh, I mean, I, I think e-commerce has all the components of everything that we run away from. And in fact, <laughs> I was running away from e-commerce for a long time because I just I don't want to deal with it. it's so technical. But at the same time, I've I've always dealt with technical topics and expertise is is really uh, what I um, 
the, I think the cornerstone of my my business and my positioning is being an expert in certain areas so that I can be that sought after um, expert. And and so yes, e-commerce has a lot of nuances, a lot of of, of complexity. So one of those yeah, we haven't being, even talked about shipping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so one of those is is inventory and cost of goods sold. Uh, so what we need to know here is that we want to, uh, for the most part, avoid tracking inventory items. And in, 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 you see that I'm mentioning QuickBooks online a lot because that's primarily what I specialize in. Um, you possibly could track inventory in QuickBooks Enterprise because it's more robust. But for QuickBooks Online, it has limited functionality and, and it's not really made for for e-commerce because in, in QBO or even in desktop, when you're selling inventories based on on selling it because you invoiced a customer and when, when you enter that invoice, it's in the background uh, updating inventory and cost of goods sold. Well, you don't have invoices and um, so that pretty much breaks the workflow in QuickBooks on in QuickBooks in general for e-commerce um, sellers. So for the most part, then we want to avoid tracking inventory details or inventory by item in QuickBooks. And uh, so then you, what are your options? So one is for those very small sellers, uh, then I encourage them to at least track their inventory on a spreadsheet. And at the very least, we talk about tracking inventory once a year for tax purposes. And for them, again, if they're very, very small, maybe under $100,000 in sales, maybe they do this on the side, um, it's not their full-time um, business, then they find that easy um, to do. But uh, as Dan said, if you have a, um, if you're also doing point of sale, you have a physical location, or you're selling on multiple channels, then the the problem is that well, how do you track inventory? Um, at um, what is it? a real time inventory when you're selling on multiple channels? Because you might have you know five widgets, and maybe you sold three on Amazon a minute ago and now you sold two on Shopify um, two minutes ago. And so then, then you have to know, okay, how many do I really have um, so that I can you know, fulfill those orders? So then we have to look at cloud inventory apps. And the ones that, um, that I recommend that other people who do e-commerce recommend are Ecom Dash, Soho Inventory, Deer Systems and Sin7, and there are some others that are higher priced as well, but these are in in general the ones that um, that I recommend to my clients. And again, it depends on their needs and and what what they what's going to work for their specific business. Yeah, that that is a that's a huge call out because when you have, uh, I mean, even just Amazon itself, there's so many different ways to to sell on amazon um you know are they sending their inventory to uh to the fulfillment center and then amazon's actually doing the 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 the, send, the sending out of the, the 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 inventory do they want to keep track of that obviously they would uh, typically they want to know where their stuff is <laughs> at any given time um but yeah then when you add another sales channel like ebay or etsy or uh even their 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 website uh it gets exponentially uh, more difficult to manage and, and that's where another solution would come in handy to be able to manage that. Yeah, I work with a client that sells um, like high-end home decor items mm -hmm. and they sell at a physical store and online and they're using Shopify and then Shopify has a point of sale system as well as um, being able to sell online and even that even though it is in the same sales channel is very challenging for them because they have to manage the inventory and they can't manage it uh, that's another thing to understand is that you don't necessarily manage the inventory uh, within the sales channels you have to do it separately um, and in this case our client uses ecom dash gotcha all right so um 
So then how do we track that inventory if we're not going to to um, to up uh, to track inventory items in QuickBooks? So as I said, you, either you have a spreadsheet using that inventory app, you're going to then calculate what that the dollar amount of that inventory cost as of the end of the month or end of the the year and um, in QuickBooks and then you are adjusting inventory the inventory amount using a journal entry. So it makes it simple from that standpoint. We don't have to track inventory in QuickBooks, um, but um, again, it's it's more about then how are you going to track it outside of QuickBooks and, and helping our clients to figure out what's the best way to do that. So with most of um, you know what you're what you're referring to, um, the the customer is going to be living in their e-commerce app for for lack of a better word, and then um, you know like you as the bookkeeper would be living in in QuickBooks and making those uh, behind the scenes adjustments. Exactly, specifically? and I, I think also that it's probably a really good thing to do that because. I think most e-commerce sellers understand that it is very complex to try to do their own books. And they also know that if they do the, their financials based on just what's being deposited in QuickBooks, they're not getting a true picture of their profitability. And especially with Amazon, because Amazon has so many fees. <laughs> and And so... I think it really encourages that relationship with with my e-commerce clients of um, not just the, the the support and value that I bring, but also what they see in QuickBooks is is uh, helping them really get a clear picture of their profits instead of them trying to to get in there and trying to work on their bookkeeping, uh, which I think we when I look at other uh, clients in other industries, that's more their their mindset is they're they're trying to do their own box instead of trying to see how profitable they are. Awesome. I think uh, next we have a another poll. So. We do. All right. So yeah, how many e-commerce clients do you currently have? Uh, none. One to two, three to five, or more than that. Um, one of the questions that, that came up is, uh, I don't know if we're going to be talking about this uh, today or have enough time, uh, is about the purchase side of, of how, how purchasing works in, in, when e-commerce is involved. Do you want to maybe address that? Uh, yes. I mean, I can do it very quickly. Do you want me to talk about that now while they're doing their poll? Yeah, if you, okay. I, I didn't know if we had a slide devoted for for purchasing uh, or we we don't. But when we're when I was talking about the um the apps to track inventory, there are also um apps that are that are where you do all of the inventory management, including the uh, purchasing. So then you've got purchase orders, mm -hmm. uh, the inventory receipts. All of that is is then being managed in those cloud inventory apps. So hopefully yeah. I, I answer that person's question. But um, yes. yeah, so it is much, aside from just tracking inventory, you're doing the whole uh, pur purchase management in those apps. Yeah, same same kind of thing of what we were talking about before where management, you know, they're, they're going to live in the e-commerce side of things. That's where they're going to do yeah. the, you know, the, the, the ins and outs of, of uh, the daily activity. Mm -hmm. And then the QuickBooks side of things is really just the 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 landing, the foundation of of that of that business. Yeah. Let's uh, share the results. All right. So most people either have one or two clients or none at all. Um, and then we have some other folks that are that are in this niche, like like you, Veronica. <laughs> okay. So moving back to where we left off. Sales right. tax, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Run away while you can. <laughs> All of a sudden, our attendance just dropped off. I don't know oh what happened. <laughs> don't go away. <laughs> so, yeah, if it wasn't complex enough, then you have to throw in sales tax, which has been changing uh, quite a bit in the last year. So right away, I'm giving you some resources for you to, to check out. Um, Avalara has some great resources 
and and what you have to understand that the rules change and they continue to change so be aware of where you're getting this information and i would certainly not trust the facebook groups or any forums for for what the rules are um, so um, as i said avalaris has some very good resources so i've, I've given you um, those resources and um, also understand that each state has specific rules. I mean, I sometimes get questions from people of, of like, I'm in the state of California and I need to know how to do blah, blah, blah. And like, okay, I'm in Texas. I don't really know, um, but I would look it up. I would contact that state. I would make sure that I understood what was required um, and definitely don't assume um, and most of all, if you don't know, even after you looked up the rules for that state, I would contact that state's Department of Revenue to make sure that uh, I'm following exactly what they want me to do. Um, also look out for um, for local rules. So counties, municipal municipalities have different rules as well. Yeah, I, uh, I used to have a friend who worked at the Arizona Department of Revenue and uh, I just uh, asked her at, I won't, you know, how many, you know, different municipalities, you know, cause everything came into the, to, to the state office and then she would then, you know, divvy it up by, by municipalities. And so there's, there's 500 and diff different municipalities in, just in the state of Arizona um, that have different rules about, you know, what's taxable, where it's taxable, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. And when you talked about, Okay, you do you do talk about Nexus a little bit more. So let's <laughs> that segues right into my next question about what is a Nexus? Because yes. I have a street here. I have a street here up the road that's called Nexus, and that's oh. not what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So Nexus, which is an odd word that doesn't come up except I think in this case, um, <laughs> it, it, the the definition is the level of connection between a taxing jurisdiction such as a state and an entity such as a business. So it's just that what level of connection does a business have with with a state, for example. Uh, and in the, in the past, it used to be easy because it was just physical presence. If you had a physical presence in that state or that county or municipality, then you had to collect and remit sales taxes. So that was easy enough. But one of the challenges then becomes that for Amazon, what we call FBA, which means fulfilled by Amazon, uh, for those sellers, they have physical presence when um, when they ship products to Amazon and they ship them to different uh, Amazon facilities throughout the country. So by having those products in those different uh, states, now you have Nexus. So that adds a layer of complexity and especially I think Amazon will sometimes send, send your product from one warehouse in one state to another without you knowing it. And all of a sudden like, oh, you now have Nexus in these other states as well. Yeah, yeah that was a big, you know, a few years ago, that was a big advantage of online selling is, oh, I don't have to charge sales tax. Well, yeah. the states realized, hey, <laughs> we're missing out on a lot of uh, revenue because things are being sold in our state, but not um, being remitted as, as far as sales tax payments, either by the, the seller or uh or, or the supplier. Yeah. So then, um, as you said, the, the states got smart and said, hey, we need our share of the revenue. So then now we have economic nexus. So economic ne nexus allows the states to look to criteria beyond physical presence in evaluating that connection. And if you haven't heard of the uh, South Dakota versus Wayfair, uh, court, um, court case in June of 2008, basically the, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld this decision uh, allowing the state of South Dakota to begin collecting sales taxes based on economic nexus, and then a large number of states have um, followed suit after that also having their own economic nexus rules. So what you have to understand is that each state has thresholds. And if you look at the um, the links that I'm we're providing, uh, it's on the previous slide, um, the links to all of the Avalara resources, then you can look up the rules by state and, and by different type of nexus, and then they will show you the these thresholds. The thresholds can be a mi minimum amount of sales 
or a minimum amount of transactions. For some states, the thresholds are really large because they're trying to go after the, the big guys and not the little guys. And so um, I see a lot of, of accountants and bookkeepers and kind of panic that, oh, this client is selling online and what are we gonna do about sales taxes? Well, understand first of all, again, the rules are different for every state and each state has a threshold. Um, and so then you don't collect sales tax if you're below the threshold you have to keep an eye on that threshold on, on the thresholds but the state of kansas does not have a threshold <laughs> so if you um have clients who are selling in the state of kansas then you need to help them assess their risk and uh, determine whether they need you know they should be filing in that state um and no, that no, when you say selling in uh this gets a this gets oh, a little yeah. little confusing so does that mean that they're uh, obviously they're not physically in the yeah. state of canvas but if they're selling uh, to or are shipping to the Correct. client their end customer buying online they could be anywhere they could be in california new york uh, florida if uh, they have a customer who's so who's who is in uh, kansas that's what you're talking about and then that's where yes. they're shipping it to Yes, that's it. Thank you for that um, nuance because then it's the yeah, economic nexus. You don't have to physically be in that state. You're selling to people in that state. So, yes. Um, all right. Next is, um, let me see, sales tax apps. So then how do we track this? How do we know if we've met the threshold and what do we do once we have um, met these thresholds in these states? So you have the option of filing these sales taxes manually, which I know some people do, or you can use apps. The apps that you can use are Avalara, TaxJar, and Taxify are the ones that are probably the gold standard um, that you can use. And now what do they, where, where do they come in in the in relation to the 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 the, the tech, you know, uh, so they do they integrate into the the sales channel, the sales channel, and then they'll pull out all that information and then yes. keep you in compliance, which is yeah, which is and great so because I, then there's a penalty involved if you don't do that, right? <laughs> and some apps like Tax Jar, you can sign up for free and they will monitor all the thresholds for you. Um, when you connect, you know, tax jar, say to, to Shopify, for example. And then once you uh, meet the threshold, then you help your client to register for those sales taxes. And only then you begin collecting sales tax, collecting and remitting those sales taxes. So you don't want to be collecting sales taxes before you register, you have to do it after you register. So with with regards to sales tax, it's more of a when do I cross the threshold, and then once I cross the threshold, then I need to register, and then I need to start collecting and remitting. Is Correct. That right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And finally, then you have to understand that the, the, on top of all that, now we have marketplace facilitator states, and and so this is where the states try to make it easier. For the big guys, again, the Amazon, the you know Walmart, Etsy, Wayfair, those um, sellers, those marketplaces to actually um, collect and remit sales taxes on behalf of online sellers. And so it makes it easier for those online sellers because they don't have to now worry about um, necessarily filing and remitting, but um, the, the but you know something to keep in mind, which I've had a couple of clients uh, come across this. Um, some of these rules went into effect in October of last year, and some of my clients were still paying sales taxes even after Amazon started co collecting and paying sales taxes on their behalf. So now that we've done their books, we found that they actually overpaid their sales taxes. So they're, you know, they're so worried about being in compliance, they don't realize that like, oh, Amazon's already collecting this for me and I don't have to. So um, a lot of opportunities, I think, to, to, to help clients be in compliance, to help clients to 
to um, to you know save money if they're overpaying their taxes and help mm -hmm. them to um, to really feel more confident in what they're doing because they're actually really scared of all of these these rules and because they are very complex. Great. All right, and on to the next poll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So our next poll is which of, of you know of all the things that we've uh, shown here today, what seems to be the most challenging uh, to set up or and or use? So inventory, sales tax, the integrations piece, or choosing an online sales platform. Um, so a couple of flagged questions that we that we had coming in that we could maybe address. Um, uh, Michelle, you want to uh, bring those up or? No. Well, no, that's okay. I flagged them, uh, and if okay. you wanted to read them, that's fine. Um, but yeah, we had a couple for Veronica, so you can go ahead and read them to her. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so what do you find is the best inventory app for clients who use P, uh, QBO with a storefront? So that's a lot of nuances right in just in the question. <laughs> yeah, so if they have a, a storefront, Lightspeed is one that you might look at because it's um, – it's really, uh, it's actually, I think, the made for a, a point of sales a storefront type business, and then they have added a functionality for also selling online. That's cool. Now, the automated sales tax in QBO, um, you know, the, the new sales tax uh, uh, center, uh, is that compatible with third-party apps that do the, do the invoicing or the sales? Not to my knowledge, and that it might depend on each app, but basically once you're using these third-party sales tax apps, you're filing, you're managing your sales tax in those apps, filing um, the sales taxes through those apps, and so you, you're just recording uh, a sales tax liability in QuickBooks, and then when you make the payment, you're relieving that liability. Gotcha. So you're not so using the sales tax center at that point. So just like with inventory, uh, you're you're not managing the sales tax component of that into you're just really handling the the accounting piece of that. Correct. Yeah. So in some ways, if you think about it, uh, some some aspects of e-commerce are easier uh, to do from an accounting standpoint because we're not having to to mess with uh, the inventory center in QuickBooks mm -hmm. or the sales tax center in QuickBooks. And then you have other things that are more complex um, to deal with. Yeah, so I mean, again, what we had talked about before about wh who lives where, you know, you as the bookkeeper would would live in, in QBO and you're, you're really focused on the, the bookkeeping piece of that. These niche uh, or these, these uh, specific workflows are going to be handled in the different apps that you uh, that you manage. And where it's a couple um, couple questions about uh, tax jar. Do they uh, do they pay the sales tax for you? Um, I know that Avalara has a variety of different uh, sales tax services that they offer. One is determining your 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 nexus, and then there's another where they actually keep you in compliance. I, I assume tax jar does the same. Actually, don't know specifically, so I might have to look into that. But I think they all offer some level of, you know, beyond just uh, tracking the sales tax. But um, mm -hmm. I would have to look. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a um, like a demonstration of of Avalara, and I was surprised to know that there's five different services that they offer when it comes to sales yeah. tax. I thought it was just, oh, okay, let, we'll pay your sales tax and collect that for you. Yeah, and there are some services too, and I think one that I didn't mention that's called Luma Tax that will actually um, do an assessment, so a risk assessment, and essentially look at um, all of the different states in which a, a, a seller it has any sort of nexus, and um, and then determine whether they have to register, actually registering them, um, and and helping them manage um, the sales tax as well. Yeah, and all of those all of those sales tax uh, apps. Um, I mean, they they're they're great resources. Just if you even don't if you don't even use them, they have yeah. a lot of free resources uh, to keep you um, you know aware of what the rules are, what what rules have changed, and then at least give you an idea of okay, maybe we need to add this on. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. So again, it's like when I was talking about assessing and um, different um, apps um, to uh, as far as connecting QBO and your sales channels, um, it's all the same for any app of assessing the client's needs, uh, understanding what they really need, what's specific to their business, finding uh, a solution for them, testing and uh, implementing. Gotcha. Uh, so as far as the the uh, the, the poll poll results, it was pretty split <laughs> uh, between what what was most challenging. Uh, integrations did have did take the the the, the lead there, um, and that is a big uh, a big part of that. Um, but to your point, uh, Veronica, you know if you have those kind of needs, um, and then you find a favorite that really works uh, for you, and then you you get more experience in that in that particular one, then it's not like a curveball when when someone new comes in and they have five sales channels or something yeah. <laughs> like yeah, that. You have a better better uh, point of reference. Yeah, and one thing to think about is that um, it, and what I plan to do, I'm just still uh, I feel like I'm still new in this niche <laughs> uh, because I, I switched to this niche last year and I'm still learning a lot, but I would probably then end up choosing perhaps a particular sales channel and even a specific, um, a specific like say I'm going to specialize only on clients that use TaxJar or only on clients that use Ecom Dash and to narrow down that niche even more because then that would allow me to be like really, really good and knowledgeable in those specific apps. Uh, there are people that only specialize in Amazon sellers. Um, I also, I happen to like people who sell on Shopify. <laughs> so um, you just never know. You have to be open, I think, in this niche to, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of variety, and then probably narrow it down uh, further or even to specific types of sellers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I mean, uh, my uh, my web solution offering really only works with Webgility, so that has kind of guided me as as far as what what apps I want to specialize in, uh, because I have a a way to get that, and then there's an app to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> So our last, I think we're just going to wrap up here. I mean, we're coming in, coming in for a landing. Yes, <laughs> Hopefully yes, we didn't so. uh, overwhelm everyone. <laughs> right, because we could talk about it for days and hours. <laughs> yeah, so just as a wrap up to understand that the e-commerce, and by the way, well, I normally do lowercase e-commerce. Uh, <laughs> to answer your question, Dan, from before, how do you, the proper spelling. But um, yeah, so to wrap up, um, e-commerce is, complex. Um, you have to understand in terms of accounting that you have sales channels, you have payment processors, um, there are timing differences. Um, the different apps uh, can make it very complex as well as inventory and cost of goods sold and how you manage that, how you track it, and sales taxes as we just talked. However, in that complexity, you have opportunities uh, to become an advisor to your uh, clients, uh, especially when it comes to app integrations. And as we talked about choosing the right apps uh, for them, helping them integrate those apps, um, streamlining their systems and processes, especially once you have some uh, these sellers that are selling in multiple channels, they can put together some very clunky uh, processes and uh, what as I talked about the the client that sells these these high-end home decor items that they boy it was just amazing what they were attempting to do and obviously seeing it wasn't working for them and then helping them streamline what they're doing um, helping clients with their inventory management the the purchasing cycle um, inventory cycle helping them also to understand what they need to do because many of them don't know as well as uh, managing, customizing, uh, streamlining that, and um, even helping clients set up their accounting structure. Uh, what are the accounts that they need in their chart of accounts uh, to properly do um, e-commerce accounting? Um, what else, to, or managing inventory? Okay, how do you adjust inventory? Um, 
cost of goods sold is the other. How do I? Well, if you adjust inventory, you're adjusting cost of goods. But um, helping them to set up that accounting structure so that they can get um, good numbers and again have a clear view into their profits. And lastly, beware of integrations. <laughs> Always say that. Beware of those integrations. Avoid the data dump. Make sure that you understand what these apps are doing when they're send, sending data over to QuickBooks because you can end up with some huge data dump. And as we said before, if you don't have a good backup or you haven't tested, then you're going to run into problems. Yeah, right Right before I, I uh, logged in here, I was taking out the trash, <laughs> speaking of dump, and the bag broke. And, <laughs> and coffee grounds were everywhere. And the, that's the kind of accounting mess you can be dealing with when uh, when you're dealing with a with an app that says works with QuickBooks, oh. um, <laughs> you, know, you want to get an Not understanding of yeah, you want buyer beware. Make sure you understand. Well, what does that mean? Is it is it an IIF file and it doesn't even work with QuickBooks Online or something yeah. like that? Or do you need to now another app to get that information into your QuickBooks Online? Yeah, and even the ones that say that they will track inventory in QuickBooks. I, I I run away <laughs> unless I mean, <laughs> again it's the ones that I've, I have seen I don't know if they all do that but just beware um, of okay again make sure that's really the best way to go test it out make sure mm -hmm. that it works awesome good good tips and and tricks what you're talking about here today so I think our last uh, last poll is coming up and that was just a informative uh, do you want to know more about the apps that work in e-commerce so like we talked a lot about tax jar or avalara for sales tax or uh, a to x you know if we had them on would that be would you find use in that and so we had a couple questions while you're filling that out uh, let's see here uh, inventory assemblies we didn't even talk about you know that nuance of inventory <laughs> Uh, do you have any suggestions, Veronica, for inventory assembly apps for e-commerce, or is that really covered in those in those apps that you already talked about? Not in all of them that I talked about, but there are certainly um, cloud inventory apps that will manage um, assemblies, and it's a matter of identifying. Um, which ones those are. I don't have clients that um, that have assemblies right now, so I, I don't know of specific apps to tell you, but I know that they are there. Awesome. Yeah, I, um, I, I had a, uh, I first learned about this um, at last year's Scaling New Heights. I, I went to a breakout for, for e-commerce and uh, wow, yeah, there was just, I thought I knew a lot about it, but then I was realized, oh, I <laughs> there's more. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to know, uh, but I, I love the way that you you really kind of laid it laid it out and and kind of broke it out into the different the different areas and those different nuances of those areas. So this is this has been a great uh, great session. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, so yeah, so definitely uh, from the poll, uh, a big a big thought about uh, yes, that would be a it would be a good idea to learn learn some more um, and maybe we can bring some some apps to come in and, and talk about their solution uh, in the, the QB power hour so we have a few minutes um, before before the the close I know Hector uh, Hector Garcia is doing a a very timely webinar today as well about um, you know further uh, helping yourself uh, work from home so uh, you know in this in this environment uh, that seems to be a hot commodity <laughs> a lot of people are uh, are needing to do that if they're not already <laughs> um, so I, I want to give him the opportunity to be able to uh, you know if, if you need to hop off we certainly understand that if that's if, if you want to attend that that webinar as well um, and then a lot of people had some questions Veronica how can they get in touch with you <laughs> um, what's the best way to to uh, to get in touch with you moving forward? Um, I think you have your we we put your contact information again. Uh, the best way on the next slides. If you want to, since you're in control, can you advance the, okay. <laughs> the slide there? 
One more. Yes. So there we go. The best way if you have any questions or want to continue a, a, the conversation is to join my Facebook group. And that's five, <clears throat> excuse me, five minute bookkeeping with QuickBooks Online. And we have a link um, to that in the handout. Um, if you have um, other specific questions or anything else, you can even message me through Facebook or go to my my um, website, uh, BM Wasek, and um, connect with me through that as well. Awesome, Michelle. Any uh, any clothing clothing closing thoughts? <laughs> No, I, Veronica, we really appreciate sharing your knowledge with all of our listeners and things like that. One thing um, uh, Belinda had asked is, you know, what are some specific shows or conferences that you went? Any any tips for somebody who wants to start specializing in this um, or any, you know, pointers that you could share with them? Absolutely. So number one is, um, as I've, even for my own self, because I like to call myself an expert in, and I am an expert in many areas, e-commerce, and I, I can't say I'm there yet, but I have a goal within, um, I guess I was within nine months to be an expert in e-commerce. So first of all, you, you won't know everything about e-commerce and you have to be okay with that. Um, second is check out um, Catching Clouds Academy. They sell a an Amazon accounting course and an, a Shopify accounting course, um, and I purchased both courses, and that's that was the foundation uh, for me to to learn. Um, the other person to um, to watch is Brittany Brown with Ledger Gurus. They specialize in e-commerce, and they have a lot of of resources on their website through their blog. Um, I pretty much read every blog post that they had. Um, if you go to cpaacademy.org, uh, Brittany Brown also has webinars that she has done on e-commerce. And again, just I mean it for me, it was just consuming everything uh, available about e-commerce from those uh, resources. And and I think lastly is, is if you're one of those people that like me, <laughs> like uh, I'm this uh, workflows nerd <laughs> that uh, understanding a, this different um, marketplaces or sales channels, the payment processors and what you see in the bank account is just is tracing the transactions from from the, the sales channel to the payment processor to QuickBooks. Understanding how that works uh, will help you a lot because once you you get that understanding most um, sales channels work in a very similar way and and I, I mean there are new sales channels that i'm hearing about all the time new payment processors and and so instead of telling the client no i don't work with that they say well yeah, uh, yeah, we'll have to figure it. You know, I may need to figure it out because I haven't come across it before. But because I understand how these other, uh, how other things work in e-commerce, and it's fairly easy to figure it out. Awesome. Well, we can Those tell. Those are great resources. Yeah, and of course, sales tax. All this, the resources that I gave you, <laughs> check those out as well. And um, also in my YouTube channel, I'm continuing to put out. Um, videos um, about e-commerce. So I, I have a playlist specific to e-commerce and uh, check that out as well. Um, I, in some of those videos, I'm literally learning something like that day and doing a video <laughs> about like it a, because uh, my learning curve is, is very steep right now. But it, yeah, it, I, 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 I found that out as a, as a trainer. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, once you, once you can teach it to somebody else, that just exponentially increases your understanding of that. So even if you're fumbling through it, uh, but I assume these videos are less than five minutes. Um. <laughs> some are, yeah, some are, uh, actually, typically my videos are about five minutes. Uh, my sales tax video that just came out is uh, I think about 15 minutes because it's, uh -oh. it's rather complex. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can definitely get on some some tangents here. So, yeah. So, I, again, I want to thank you for, for sharing your passion uh, with our audience at, at QB Power Hour. And I really appreciate you you coming on today and taking some of your time out of your day uh, to, to help our group. Um, and uh, and this this was fantastic. And we'll have the, the try to have the recording posted up this uh, this evening. Um, and then have it out on the podcast so you can 
review all of the great tips and tricks that, that Veronica passed on here today. So thanks yeah, again thank for- Thank you, Veronica. For, thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody for joining us today. And uh, we will see you next time where we talk about the bank feeds, another place that people run away from. <laughs> <laughs> right, have a great day. Thank you all. Everybody Bye. stay safe and healthy. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.